We would like to ask all our visitors to please pass your cards to the end of the aisle, our ushers to take them up. We'll have a record of your visit today. We're delighted to have you. I wanted to bring all of you greetings from our friends and the golden east coast of Florida. Ms. North and I have just come back from a meeting in Stewart, Florida. Brother and Sister Robert Castleman of this congregation takes their trailer down each winter and spends the winter at Stewart. The church holds them in high esteem down there. Brother Ashenfelter, who came to preacher school here in Nashville and worked with us at the Madison Church for years, is in Indian Town, 20 miles away. They attended the meeting every night. We had wonderful attendance, and we have a lot of friends down there. Many told us they were very disappointed that our Amazing Grace Bible class was not on now in West Palm and wanted to know what happened. They were a little bit aggravated, and I said, we ran out of money. They said, why didn't you tell us? We got money. We'd have helped you keep it on. I says, we shall notify you. We'll have a man come down here and talk with you, and you can do just that. We're on on the West Coast in, in Fort Myers. We're on in northern Florida and Pensacola. We think we'll soon be on in Orlando and central Florida. And I hope you'll join me in prayer that we may be able to reach some of the teeming thousands of Americans on that East Coast. In the Miami, Fort Lauderdale, uh, West Palm, Stewart, Florida area, it's just unbelievable uh, at how the population has grown in that section. We have some strong, fine congregations, and we are grateful for that. I did want to bring you some good news. We went fishing and had real good luck, brought home snook and uh, dolphin and freshwater bass and crappy and brown. And I have good news for you and bad news. The good news is we hung that old big one this time. We hung him. He was a whopper. That's the good news. The bad news is he got away. <laughs> Florida is a great section of the country, and we have thousands of friends down there. They love the Madison Church, and they all send you their best regards. I love this text that Bill has shared with us today. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for ye know not what a day will bring forth. I believe that tomorrow is one of the most dangerous words in all the English language. The tragedy of it is so real. So many people have intended to obey the gospel tomorrow, to put the kingdom of God first tomorrow, to serve Jesus tomorrow. It has slammed the gate of heaven shut on countless thousands. But the Bible is such a practical and wonderful book. And the wise man reminds us, boast not thyself of tomorrow, because you do not know what a day will bring forth. It's so dangerous to boast of tomorrow, because the desire that you have today to do right may be gone tomorrow. That conscience of yours, so tender and so wonderful today, that tells you deep within, I want to please God, I want to do right. Tomorrow it may be seared with a hot iron, as mentioned in 1 Timothy 4 and 2. Years ago I read the story of a man in his 80s who was pressing a dying pillow in New York. And he said, you know, when I was 17 years of age, I almost became a Christian. I was just on the verge of confessing Christ and being baptized. But somehow I said, I believe I'll wait a little longer. Now I am 80 and pressing a dying pillow. And never, never in my entire life was I ever that close to obeying the gospel. That burning desire I experienced that day never returned in all of my life. Tomorrow may see man incapable of doing duties. There may be sickness. There may be uh, many other reasons to keep us from doing tomorrow what we ought to do today. James tells us that we must be careful about saying, tomorrow I'm going so and so and I'm going to trade and I'm going to make gain and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. For tomorrow may never come. Death could claim us. 
You know, the Bible is filled with expressions that teach the brevity of life. The Bible calls it the shadow that fleeth, a flower that is cut down, the weaver's shuttle, water spilled on the ground, the swift ship. James calls life a vapor that appeareth for a little while. The poet has said, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. You recognize that from Macbeth, but it's true. You know, in 2 Samuel 15 and 18, we learn that Absalom, who rebelled against his father, lost the battle because he waited till tomorrow. In the bloodiest battle, as far as I know, ever fought in American history, it was right down here on the Tennessee River in Shiloh. And when the sun went down on that fateful day, the Union Army was pinned to the Tennessee River. Just a little bit more, and the Union Army would have been in the river, and the battle would have been over, and maybe the war would have taken a different course. But that day, General Buell from Columbia was marching down the turnpike through Waynesboro and on into Savannah. And that night, he crossed the river at Pickwick Landing. And when the sun came up the next day, it was a different day and a new day. And one of the bloodiest and most tragic battles in all of our history was fought. If Hitler had followed Dunkirk, the world might not know the freedom it knows today in America and in Western Europe. But he waited till tomorrow, and tomorrow was too late. You know, in the parable of the Great Supper recorded in the 14th chapter of the book of Luke, we can learn the dangers of tomorrow. You remember a certain man made a great supper, and he sent and invited the bidden guests the specially chosen guest. And one said, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go see it. And he turned down the invitation, putting it off till tomorrow. Well, when you buy a piece of ground, you generally walk over it and think about it. I can remember as a lad walking over the farms in Larch County with my father. One day we spent almost all day on one little farm. My father looked at every inch of that farm, and when he came back, he says, I'm not going to pay $3,000 for this farm. Too many gullies, too many trees. And so he refused to pay the $3,000. Today, I don't guess it could be bought for $150,000. But this man was looking for an excuse. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I must go prove them. You do not buy livestock and then go prove it. You prove it and buy it and then sometimes get very sick of it. The third man, I think, had the most flimsy of all excuses. He didn't want to accept that invitation. And so he said, I have married a wife and cannot come. If a man would treat his wife with half the common courtesy, he treated her before he married her, wouldn't we have wonderful homes? I'm quite sure this fellow would have been glad to have come to the feast, and the wife to have a day out, if she'd been his sweetheart. But she was his wife, so he couldn't come. I think it'd be good for all of us to perform an experiment sometime in our home. Treat your wife with the courtesy you treated her before you married, or with the common courtesy you treat the boys and girls at the office. See what a difference it'll make in your home. But the interesting thing in this story is that all these who would not accept that invitation, the Bible says, go out into the highways and byways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house be, may be filled. For none of those bidden guests shall taste of my supper. Not a single one of those who said tomorrow will be permitted to taste of that heavenly feast. The spirit of tomorrow caused the ruin of the foolish virgins. You remember there were five wise and five foolish, according to Matthew, the 25th chapter. 
And the five that were wise had oil in their lamps and were prepared. The five foolish were not prepared. Oh, we can get oil tomorrow. Why be in any hurry? We'll wait till tomorrow. But the Bible says that night the bridegroom came and those who had oil in their lamps went with the bridegroom into the feast. But the foolish virgins had to go buy oil and when they came back, it was too late. Tomorrow was too late. We see tomorrow in the life of Felix in the 24th chapter of the book of Acts. I think nearly any of us would just borrow any amount of money we could borrow to hear the Apostle Paul. I'd fly around the world 10 times to get to see that man Saul of Tarsus and to get to hear uh, the Apostle Paul as he later became preach. But Felix got to hear him and the Bible says when this man Paul reasoned on temperance and righteousness and judgment to come, that old Felix trembled. For Felix was an intemperate man. He sat in judgment on others. But Paul reminded him one of these days, you won't be the judge, you will be judged. And Felix trembled. But he said, in essence, tomorrow, go thy way for this time when I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you. And he did call for Felix, hoping Felix would, uh, uh, did call for Paul to come before him. For Felix hoped that Paul would offer him a bribe. But as far as we know, he never came that close to accepting Christ again. Tomorrow cost him his soul. The rich fool that we read about in Luke, the 12th chapter, verses 16 to 21, was living for tomorrow. When the bumper crop came, he said, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger barns and I'll say to my soul, soul, take thine ease. You have much laid up for many years. There's nothing to worry about. For tomorrow is going to be wonderful. But the Bible says, the God of heaven that night says, thou fool. Tonight your soul is required of thee. What now is going to happen to all that you have laid up? You know, there are tens of thousands of old people in the state of Florida. Many have gone there to retire because they cannot pay those outrageous heat bills in Maine and Ohio and Illinois. But I get the feeling every time I go that thousands of them are very unhappy, that they'd give anything in the world if they could be back home in Illinois or Indiana or Iowa or Maine. I saw one man in West Palm with his chauffeur. Looked like he could barely walk with help. I don't think the man could have held a fishing rod by himself. I'm sure he had much money. But if in his lifetime he had looked forward to today, he had to be a crushed and disappointed man. You know the young man who said to Jesus tomorrow in Matthew 8 and 21, when the Lord says, come and follow me. But he said, suffer me first to bury my father. Now what he was talking about was not actually taking his father out and putting him in the cemetery. What he was saying is, my, my parents are old. Let me take care of my parents. And then after I do that, I'll consider following you. But Jesus told him that will not do. Let the dead bury the dead. Let the dead spiritually bury the dead physically. You come and follow me. Tomorrow will be too late. The Lord must be served now. You know, I have known in my ministry a few cases of people that have married for money, hoping that tomorrow I'll be the king. Tomorrow I'll have the money. Tomorrow I'll be in control. Young people, I want to share something with you. Everybody I have ever known in my life that married for money earned every quarter of it. I remember one man was a doormat. For 30 years they wiped their feet on that man. But he married for money. He stuck it out 30 years and finally the death came. And he was king. And you know what happened as sure as I'm standing here in two weeks? That old heart hit him, and he died. I'd rather marry a young man 
with an apple in his hand as to marry an old man with a hundred acres of land. Those who marry for money, counting all their dreams tomorrow, are generally exceedingly and desperately disappointed. Yes, this young man says, tomorrow, but now wait, my parents are old, and I'll consider you when they're gone. Jesus says that'll never do. Boast not thyself of tomorrow. You know, this arrangement keeps us fully dependent on God. I'm glad, aren't you? I'm glad the Madison Church must live one day at a time depending on God. 99% of our programs, if you stop giving, will die, and I believe most of them would die within a week. I'm sure our television ministry would be dead as a doornail within one week if you stopped giving. I doubt if our child care program could last over 10 days if you stopped giving. I'm doubting if our mission program could last over one week if you quit giving. And you know I like it like that. I think it's wonderful. We need to live depending on God every single day. I remember Brother Lilly asked me one time, what are you going to do when the people at the Madison Church, if the time comes, they will not give for the Bible count? And I said, Brother Lilly, as far as I'm concerned, I promise you, I'll let it die. I think it should die. The very day the people at Madison do not want to give to teach the Bible to the young people at the camp, let it die. But its glory would be embalmed. This arrangement keeps us fully dependent on God. And that is good for us. By this means, he keeps the world in all. Let us beware of pride and vanity about tomorrow, for we know not what a day will bring forth. And yet let us not despair of tomorrow, for God will provide. If we serve him today and do his will today, God will provide. Let us be every day prepared for what tomorrow may bring, for today is ours. Many are waiting until tomorrow. They're waiting till tomorrow to obey the gospel. They're waiting till tomorrow to be restored. I'm going to come back to the church, but I'm going to wait till tomorrow. And many are saying, I'm going to live the Christian life, but not now, tomorrow. And many are saying, I'll give time to my children, and I'll rear my children right, but I'll do it tomorrow. But ladies and gentlemen, the great word in the Bible is always today. Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your hearts. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. The great word of the Bible is today. Love God today. Serve God today. Forgive your fellow man today. Put the church first in your heart today. Love your family today. And then if there is a tomorrow, the God of heaven will preserve and protect you. And if there isn't a tomorrow, it's all right. For to live is Christ and to die is gain. The poet has said, he was going to be all that a mortal should be tomorrow. No one would be better than he tomorrow. Each morning he stacked up the letters he'd write tomorrow. He, it was too bad indeed he was too busy to see Bill, but he promised to see him tomorrow. The greatest of workers this man would have been tomorrow. The world would have known him had he ever seen tomorrow. But the fact is he died and faded from view, and all that was left when living was through was a mountain of things he intended to do tomorrow. Tomorrow is dangerous and sad and heartbreaking. But today is the word of the Bible. Today is the day of salvation. I wonder in this great audience this morning, is there one soul here who has never named the name of Jesus, who's never confessed Jesus and never been baptized into Jesus Christ? I want you to do it today. If there's one in this audience, you're a member of the church, but you've deserted, you've left, you've quit, 
then I want you to come back today. If you're new in the community and a member of the Church of Our Lord, I wish you'd place membership with us today. Everybody needs a church home. We need you and we want you and love you. Would you come today while together we stand and everybody sing.